you know, um, I'm going to say some things this morning that probably seem very uh, opposite of what just happened in our worship time. <laughs> Pastor Margie, thank you. Because here's the thing. Um, God is so good. And sometimes we get caught uh, in this, this world we live in. And uh, how many know that this is true? Life... is not fair. How many know that life is not fair? You know, sometimes we, we, you know, we think everything should be fair, everything should be equal, everything should be good, but life is not fair. And, and if you think it is, you need to have a conversation with me because I'd like to know how it's fair. Now, one of, the, one of my... Uh, a, a movie I like to watch, I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, this is the stupidest movie I've ever seen. I, turned, I, I came in halfway through, and I never watched the whole movie, and I was just like, this is dumb. And then I watched it again, and I watched the whole thing, and I was like, okay, it's not really dumb. And then I've watched it so many times now that I could probably quote a lot of the lines in the movie because it's just so funny. <laughs> the movie is The Prince's Bride. Now, if you've never seen this movie... Um, it starts with this kid, he's at home sick in his bed, and his grandfather comes over to read him a story. And he's all upset about his grandfather coming over, because he's like, you know, you know, every time he comes, he pinches my cheek. And, you know, his grandfather says to him, hey, I brought you a gift. And he goes, well, what is it? And he goes, it's a book. And he goes, a book? Like, he brought me a book. And then, and then he says, you know, well, the book is full of great things, like there's sword fighting, and, and there's romance, and there's the giants, and there's war. And, and he goes on and all on. And the kid's like, well, I, I guess so. <laughs> well, halfway through the movie, the kid's now into the movie. He's into the story, right? The grandfather's telling the story, and they switch back and forth between this kid in his bed and the story being played out by the actors, The Prince's Bride. And about halfway through the movie, there's this, this moment where the kid goes, wait, 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 Grandpa, that shouldn't happen. That's not the way it should be. Now his grandfather is played by Peter Falk. <clears throat> and he says, who said life isn't fair? Or who said life is fair? Right, because the kid says, but it's not fair. That's not fair. And, and he says, who says life isn't fair? Right? Who says life is fair? Now, if, if you got kids, you might have said that to your kid once or twice. You know, because they came to you. Well, you know, you didn't do that for me, but you did it for them. Well, it's not fair. Well, life isn't fair. And, and sometimes we, we're, we're so quick to want it to be fair. You see, we live in a world that's not fair. And I, I, I'm, I'm bold enough to say that it never will be. Now you may say, Pastor, like you would really say that? Yeah. I don't think our world will ever be fair. Here's why. Because we're here. Now, now you may say, well, you know, I, I, I try to be fair. I can guarantee, no matter how fair you are, somebody thinks you're not. You could be the fairest person on the planet, and I guarantee somebody will think you're not. Because life isn't fair. There's a lot of things about life that, that just doesn't make sense. You know, it doesn't matter where we go. It doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter how good we think we are. There are going to be things that we see that are unfair. Is that fair to say? Is that okay to say? Right? It's true. Now, it's interesting because we have this picture sometimes of what fair is. I know I, I've had trouble with my own heart and my own attitudes over these last number of weeks sometimes. 
I, I think something's not fair, and, and it's usually because I don't know the whole story. I get part of the story, and I think, oh, that's not fair. Like, I can't believe that they do that. Like, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe, you mean your teacher said what? And you may say, Pastor, don't pick on teachers. I'm not picking on anyone. But, you know, there are lots of things that happen that we kind of think isn't fair or isn't right. Or, and and we, we, we assume we know it all. Now, before I pick on all of us for any length of time, I think I'm going to go to the Scriptures and just show you something that's really kind of one of those stories that just ticks me off when I read it. <laughs> Do you know that the Scriptures are full of things that are unfair? I mean, these are stories that you just kind of shake your head and you go, really, God? Like, really? How about this one? It's a story found in Matthew 20. Jesus is, is, is talking to the crowd and he's telling them this story. And I'm sure when I start to read it, you'll go, oh, I know that story. I've heard that story. I can guarantee that if this story happened today in real life, somebody would be going to the labor board or the government complaining. Life's not fair. So listen to what it says in verse 1 of chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a, daria, a, a denarius, about the daily wage for a day at that time. He, he agreed to pay them a, der, a, a denarius for the day and, send them into, and sent them into the, his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw some others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, hey, you also go and work in the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. Now I love this line, whatever is right. Hear that line? Whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found some still others standing around and he asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. So he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last one we hired. Now I love this. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't pay off the guys that have been there all day first. He pays off the guy that's been there an hour. The workers were, who were hired about five in the afternoon came in, each received a Daenerys. So when those who, had, who came, who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a Daenerys. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us. Who, who have bore the burden of the work in the heat of the day? Now doesn't this make you feel a little bit, a little bit uh, like this story is unfair? I mean, think about it. They'd worked all day. The guy who showed up like an hour before quitting time, he gets the same money. I mean, you can be guaranteed if this happened today, you know, somebody would be at the labor board. You know, the owner would be like, you know, getting charged for something, you know, unfair pay or something. Like there was something would happen, right? But Jesus is telling this story and he, and he says, oh, and you know, yeah. And they're all upset. You see, if we read the story, it sounds very unfair. It sounds very unfair. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Why would Jesus tell this story and, and make this statement, you know, it seems so unfair. Have you ever been in a situation you felt like you were being treated unfair? And it doesn't have to be at work. 
I mean, I know people who have felt unfairly treated at church or at school or in the neighborhood or by their family. I mean, I've heard people say to me, well, you don't know how they were. It was so unfair the way they treated me. Folks, guess what? Life is that way. It is. And, and we want to fix it all. And we can't fix it all. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we've all felt at some point, felt like it was unfair. We were unfairly treated for something. I heard somebody saw a story, or I was told a story of somebody who posted something. Their their kids were doing something, and and they were involved in this thing, and the organization that was running this thing canceled the program. And this person just went ballistic on Facebook and told everybody how horrible these people were for what they did. It was unfair! They did it. They just did it to hurt us. They blah, blah, blah. How many know that um, sometimes things happen. It sounds like fun down there. <clears throat> it's probably going to be more fun than up here. Um, you know, maybe you, you, you've worked hard and, and you felt like other people weren't getting paid as, you know, were getting paid more than you. Or maybe you felt like, you know, somebody else was getting away with something that you couldn't. I always, I always think it's interesting. Uh, you know, sometimes people will, will be upset because somebody got away with something that they couldn't get away with. Well, it's not fair. It doesn't matter about the fact that what they were doing was wrong. It's just not fair. I mean, they get, they could do anything and they get away with it. I can't do anything and I get in trouble. You know, we live in this world where we have the freedom to speak our mind. We just put it out there. Maybe we feel it's right to badmouth an organization for canceling a class for our kid that our kids are attending. We maybe see it un, as unfair or selfish that they canceled it, or we think it's unfair when we do it, when we do everything well, others sit back and enjoy the benefits of it. We we give and others don't. We can find unfair things everywhere we look if we want to look. And and you know. I'm really struggling. I, I've been struggling these last number of weeks with just feeling like, you know, I need to change my attitude. A number of years ago, uh, while I was in Gravenhurst, two of my closest friends in ministry... Uh, their lives were changing, their jobs were changing, and I was sitting in Gravenhurst, we were struggling financially as a church, things were rough, it was really quite bad, and uh, my one friend became the president of the Bible College, uh, Rich James. Now Rich and I have been friends since we started in ministry 20, 30 years ago almost, We've been friends all these years. And I remember him being, being elected to being the president of the Bible college. And I was like, so excited for him. And yet I was angry with myself. Because I was like, why? You know, like, like he's doing that. My other friend, uh, Pastor Jeff, he, um, he was working at the district. I had worked on, on a bunch of committees for him over the years. He was the youth director at, at Eastern Ontario. And I'd worked with him, and he was going to take over this church in New Orleans. He's the pastor of a church of about 
four or five hundred. And I was jealous. And I was like, God, this isn't fair. I've been in ministry as long as they are, and I'm sitting here in this frustrating situation. And God said, aren't you happy for your brothers? I remember about, about three months later, I, I called Jeff. And uh, I said to him, I said, Jeff, I need to apologize to you. And he's like, for what? Like, and I said, I, you know, I was really struggling and I had a really bad attitude towards what was happening in your life. And he said, bro, like, anyone would complain with what you're going through. I said, but it still wasn't right. You see, it's very easy to find a situation and think it's unfair. And I was saying to God, this is unfair. Look at them. Look at And, and you know what? I found out that everything isn't as beautiful as it looks. <laughs> you know, Jeff, Jeff was facing issues in his church. Uh, Rich was facing issues with the Bible college. I mean, and you know, I can joke about it and laugh about it now, but back then it was like, I felt like it was unfair. I was saying, God, you're, what's the deal? See, I've learned over the years that with every story that you hear, with every thing that somebody says, there's always another side to that story. I've been around long enough to know that, that I don't get the whole story when I talk to one individual. I don't get the whole picture of the story because, because that's their view and that's their side of the story. Now, as a pastor, every time I've had to sit down with a couple who are struggling in their marriage, it, it always amazes me how divided they can be and how one-sided their view can be. Well, you know, if, if he would just clean up the dishes every night, it wouldn't be a problem. And blah, 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 blah. It's all his fault. It's all his fault. And then I'd hear him. Oh, you know, you know what she does? I mean, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, whoa. There are two of you in this relationship. It's not one person's fault. And, and you know, that's the problem with, with when we hear a story. We don't get the whole story. We only get part of it. And a lot of times what happens is we think it's unfair. We look at the situation and we go, oh, it's unfair, it's not right. So when I read this story, if we don't read the last four verses, it seems pretty unfair. Now I want you to just consider this. These are the last four verses. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Did you agree to work for Daenerys? Take your pay and go. If I want to give the one who worked, was hired last, the same as I give you, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? You see, sometimes we look at situations and we're envious of somebody else's situation. We, we get to this place where we're like, well, you know, it's just not fair. I mean, like I did just as much as they did. And I, you know, I've said those things, so I, I, I don't know if you have, maybe you're, you guys are better than me, but, but you know, like, I've said those kind of things. I've said things like, well, you know, it's just not fair. Like, do you know what, you know what I did? And it's not always about money, folks, and it's not always about work. It could be in our family situation. You know, Emily's not up here, so that's good. About, about three weeks ago, she said to us, Tessa, you're not allowed to tell her this. <laughs> about three weeks ago, she said to us, you know, well, I'm not your favorite child. <laughs> she, see, she said, you know, dad's favorite is Steph. Mom's favorite is Josh, and I'm nobody's favorite. And I was like, what? So we were having this discussion and we're like, Emily, like, do you know how much you get away with that they wouldn't have got away with? Like, you, you honestly think that, that we treat them better than we treat you? So we're having this discussion. Well, then 
about two weeks, a week and a half ago, we were on the phone with Steph, and we tell her what Emily said while Emily's in the room. Well, Steph just bust up laughing. She's like, Emily, like, how could you say that? It's all right. Because she doesn't know. She doesn't know what they went through as, at her age. She was just a little child. She doesn't know the struggles they had. She doesn't know what they've gone through. She only sees it from her view. And guess what? Her view thinks that we treat them better than her. It's not true. They're just different. Right? And, and, and just because it seems like we're treating them different than her, partly because we are. Josh and Steph are in their 20s and living on their own, and they're not at home with us. So the way we respond to them is very different than the way we respond to Emily, who lives with us. Right? She's 14, Josh is 20, 22 this year, and Steph is 25. Now, is, it, is life unfair to her? Yeah, she's had some pretty, pretty unfair things happen. She's dealing with things that the other two didn't have to deal with. You know? That doesn't mean that life is unfair to her per, per se, but in her mind it is. And that's okay. She'll get over it. She'll realize that it's not as bad as she thinks. And we're very thankful for her. And she is a blessing to us. You know, look at verse 16. He says, and then Jesus, you know, that's the, the, the landowner finishes with, because I'm generous. And then Jesus says, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Now this is another one of those statements that Jesus says that I'm just kind of like, really God? So somebody who served you for 50 years might take a back seat to somebody who got saved last week. How many think that's unfair? Am I the only one that thinks that's unfair? I read that and I go, God, like, that's unfair! So let's just refresh here. Who's telling the story? Right? It's Jesus. He's telling the story. And he starts the story with this statement. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like... Now I read that and I'm like, okay, so the kingdom of heaven is unfair. Now that we've got this story and we kind of understand the idea of unfair and that the kingdom of heaven is like, I, I want to shift it a little bit. I want you to hold on to that thought. Because I want to say to you that God's kingdom is unfair. And you're probably all just about having a heart attack thinking that you know, the, pa the pastor just said God isn't fair. He's not. God isn't fair. If He was fair, you would all go to hell. If God was fair, none of us would be able to actually be in His presence. If God was actually fair, He wouldn't have put His Son on a cross. You see, God is unfair to you because you don't deserve what He's giving. See, there's two words that, that we use a lot. We talk about it and, and I don't know if we really grasp just how severe or serious they are. The first one is mercy. You see, mercy is that, that you, you don't get what you deserve. God showed His mercy and He didn't send you to hell. He shows His mercy because of His Son. He shows mercy. He doesn't give you what you deserve. He holds back. See, that is unfair. Because you deserve it. I deserve it. Oh, well, maybe you don't. I know I do. I don't deserve God's mercy. I don't deserve it. I'm not, I've not done anything to deserve His mercy. I've not done anything that, that's going to give me His mercy. He shows His mercy. How 
Have you ever considered your, expectation, your, your acceptance into the kingdom? Have you ever really considered what God has done? You see, it's easy. Oh, well, you know, God forgave me because of Christ's blood on the cross and He died and rose again and, and because of that I'm saved. But do we really understand what that means? Because God had to show mercy to do that. I mean, it's completely unfair, folks. Let me go a little further. You were forgiven of your sins by doing nothing. You did nothing to deserve your sins to be forgiven. Nothing. So those sins that you're still doing, guess what? You can't do anything to fix it other than to accept Jesus' forgiveness. You were welcomed into His kingdom without paying the price. You're called a son or a daughter even though you were on the outside before. You found mercy when you should have found punishment. This is called grace. This is called grace. Because grace is giving something to you you don't deserve. See, mercy is not giving you what you deserve, but grace is giving you something you don't deserve. Grace. Do you know that the, the grace that God's showing you, the mercy He's showing you, the, the grace that God is, is pushing towards you, is the same grace that He has shown to murderers? to alcoholics, to drug addicts, to liars, to cheaters, to robbers, deceivers, old people, middle-aged, kids, youth, gossipers. There's one you should really hold on to. Probably the biggest sin in the church. Prostitutes, gang members, wealthy, poor, middle class, wise people, stupid people. Good-looking Ugly ones. Small, short, tall, fat. I'm always amazed when I go into the, sto into, into, um, the clothing store to buy jeans or pants. I'm a big guy. You know, my waist is about a 40-inch waist. And you may say, Pastor, that should be a little smaller. Yeah, I probably should. But you know what I'm amazed with? Is I think everybody in the world must be short and fat. <laughs> because I can find a 40 waist jean, but the legs are like 32 inches long. <laughs> and I'm like, that's impossible. In case you're wondering, mine's a 36 inch inseam, and it's really hard to find a 40, 36 pair of jeans. And uh, there was one place I used, I used to be able to buy them at Mark's without any problems. Mark's would actually ship them to my house, like, if they didn't have them in stock. But I, I, was, I was always amazed when I go into a store and I see all these pants that are like 32 inches long, but like a 44 waist. And I'm like, is the world fat and short and I just missed something? Like, and I, and I sometimes say, it's unfair! How come somebody that's short can find clothes, but I can't? <laughs> Tall man's problem, sorry. <laughs> God's showing His grace to funny people, rude people, happy people, sad people. God's showing His grace to people you like and the people you don't like. God's showing His grace to brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children. You see, God's chosen to show His grace to everyone, and sometimes we think that's unfair. 
I mean, think about it. Somebody mistreats you badly. And yet God's still willing to show His grace to them. It seems pretty unfair, folks. You may even think, like, God, what are you thinking? And I honestly believe that, that God's grace and His mercy are unfair. But not to you or to someone else. They're unfair to Him. You see, His kingdom is unfair to Him. You see, we want God's grace to be fair. We want, you know, we want it. Well, you know, this is why, this is why over the years there have been times where the church has talked about, well, you know, your 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 salvation is through works. There's a reason why the church at one time did that, because they needed people to work. So they, they just said, well, you know, forgiveness comes if you do works for the kingdom. That's not what God said. Now, should your faith cause you to do works? Yeah, absolutely. But you're not going to get saved because you did things right. You're going to get saved because of His mercy and His grace, and that's the only way you're going to get saved. You know, the Bible is full of situations where God's grace is shown, and it looks pretty unfair. Hey, read Genesis. There's enough stories in Genesis to make you go, whoa. Jacob the deceiver. Joseph's brothers being forgiven. Just to name a few. If you're here today, it's no coincidence that you're here. You see, God has a plan for you. And part of his plan is to hear about his grace. And you may say, well, pastor, I know about his grace. I, I've received his grace. Really? Are your actions showing grace? You see, the Scripture is very clear that we've been called to be his ambassador of reconciliation. We've been called to express his kingdom. And the problem is, is most of us can't. Let me rephrase that. None of us can you see, without the Holy Spirit and without God's interaction in our life, we could never express His kingdom the way He expresses it. Because one of the problems we have is we have a hard time showing mercy and a really hard time showing grace. Because it's all about us. You see, we think it's unfair because of how we're treated. And we think, well, you know, how was Jesus treated? We're to be like Christ. And yet, instead of showing mercy and grace, we want to pay back for the way we've been treated. You see, God doesn't only want you to know about grace, He wants you to experience grace. He wants you to be an ambassador of grace. And the sad part is, is that many times we are not ambassadors of grace, we are ambassadors of chaos. It's not by chance that you experienced His grace and somebody else hasn't. You know, God is fair because He's showing His grace to everyone. Bible is pretty clear that he it says that he turned all men over to over to sin so that he might show mercy to all. Do you hear that? God's mercy wasn't just because you you showed up on the right day and he thought you were a great person. God's mercy was shown to you because he turned us all over to sin so that he could show his mercy to all. We're so quick to judge, we're so quick to condemn, we're so quick to have our opinion about why life isn't fair. And man, we miss what God said.
How is it that a man who condoned an execution in Acts chapter 7 could go on and write almost half of the New Testament? Can you imagine the disciples, how they must have felt like, God, this is unfair. God, what were you thinking? Do you know who he is? In case you don't know who it is, I'm talking about Paul. He sat there and condoned the execution of Stephen. They, the people witnessing it laid their coats in front of, of, of Saul. He was on the road. They laid their coats in front of him while they stoned Stephen. And he condoned it. Tell me the disciples didn't have a problem with that being unfair. How is it that someone that denied Jesus three times in one night gets to preach the Word on the day of Pentecost? How is it that two men who were not educated could confound the Sanhedrin and be seen as a man who had been with Jesus? You see, when we look through Scripture, there's so many places where God's grace is shown. His grace is shown to people, and we think, we think that we have a right to say what we say sometimes. You see, it's easy to receive grace. It's a lot harder to give it. It's a lot harder to give grace. It's easy to receive it. Oh, yeah, thank you. When I was first in ministry back in 1995, 94, 95, there was a youth guy who decided to start an email, uh, a daily email that he would send out to youth workers. So in 1995, he started this. This was the, like, you know, the infant, and the, just the start of the internet. I mean, people barely had, inter- had email. I mean, but this guy started this email, and he called it Mike's Funnies. And, and Monday to Friday, every week since 1995, he has sent out an email every single day to a bunch of youth pastors and youth leaders and other people now. And he sends it out, and it's usually just a funny little story, make you laugh and then a thought for the day. And every once in a while, about four or five times a year, he, he doesn't send a funny, he sends a story that one of his readers has sent in to him. So I want to read this story to you. The, the, uh, the story reads this way. Um, it was from one of his, one of his youth, worker, or youth, youth pastors that had sent this to him. I left work early so I could have some uninterrupted study time right before the final in my youth issues class. When I got to class, everyone was doing their last minute studying. The teacher came in and said he would review with us for just a little bit before the test. We went through the review, most of it right, it, most of it right on the study guide, but there were some things he was reviewing that I had never heard. When questioned about it, he said that they were in the book. And we were responsible for everything in the book. We couldn't really argue with that. Finally, it was time to take the test. He went around, handed them out. He told them to leave them face down on the desk until everyone had one. And then I will tell you when to start. When we turned them over, every answer on the test was filled in. The bottom of the last page said this. This is the end of your final exam. All the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A on the final exam. The reason you passed the test is because the creator of the test took it for you. 
all the work you did in preparation for this test did not help you get an A. You have just experienced grace. Now, I'm not a crier by any stretch of the imagination. That's the guy writing this, not me, because I am. So. <laughs> and I may very well do that before I'm done. I'm not a crier by any stretch of the imagination, but I had to fight back tears when answering these questions and thinking about how the Creator had passed the test for me. Discussion after went, went, went like this. I've tried to teach you all semester that you are a recipient of grace. I tried to communicate to you that you need to demonstrate this gift as a work, as you work with young people. Don't hammer them. They are not the enemy. Help them, for they will carry on your ministry if it is full of grace. Talking about how some of us had probably studied hours and some just a few minutes, but had all received the same grade, he pointed to a story Jesus told in Matthew 20, the one we read. The teacher said he had never done this kind of final before and probably would never do it again. But because of the content of many of our class discussions, we, he felt like we needed to experience grace. The sad part is, folks, is we've all experienced grace, and yet we don't really see it. We treat other people with such lack of grace. We hurt our own brothers and sisters because we don't know how to show grace. Romans 3, 23 and 24 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 15 and 21 says, But the gift is not like the trespasses. For if the man died by trespasses of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that comes by the grace of one man? Jesus Christ overflows to the many. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespasses of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reigning in life through the, the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass results in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification in life for all people. For just as though the disobedient of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespasses, the trespasses might increase, but where sin increases, grace increases all the more. So that just as the sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus brought grace to you and to me. Now this is a verse that we all have heard and it's really hard for us to put into practice because we think life is unfair. It's Romans 12.3. It says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, you ready? Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. We live in a world that thinks they're, everybody is amazing. We all think we're all better than we are. We, we pat ourselves on the back so hard that our arms should be hurting sometimes. 
But Paul says to the Romans, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. You see, it's easy to think highly of ourselves and think badly of somebody else. We all do it. If you don't think you've done it, trust me, you've done it. Just the fact that you think you haven't done it tells me you've done it. You see, we've all at some point thought we were better than somebody else. And in the process, instead of showing grace, we've shown... I don't even know what we've shown problem. When we don't show grace, all we do is hurt other people. There's more. Ephesians 1.7 In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. I, I, you know, sometimes I think we, we, we talk a lot about the blood, we talk a lot about the cross, but we, we don't talk a lot about grace. We, we, we kind of just, oh yeah, God's grace, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, God's grace. Pastor Margie, thank you. This morning during practice, you actually said that to the worship team. Thank you for your grace towards me, because I'm struggling. Ephesians 2, 5, make us alive with Christ even when we were dead and transcendent. It is by grace you have been saved. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. Folks, the grace that God has shown you is nothing that you could accomplish on your own. You didn't get it because you did something right. You got it because it's a gift from Him. It's a gift. You know, sometimes we, 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 want, we want to pick out the gift. We act as if we picked out the gift. We act like sometimes like, you know, well, you know, God gave me grace because that's what I needed. It is. But it's not because you, you did anything to get it. Now, can I just... Everybody tuck your toes in because I'm going to step on some. Because they stepped all over mine when I said when I when I was reading these passages. How about this one? Colossians four six. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Now I don't know where you're at. You probably don't have the problem I have, but sometimes my conversation lacks grace. Not always. But sometimes it lacks grace. Sometimes I forget that the person on the other side is as human as I am. And I think I'm better than them sometimes the way I talk. So let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that many know how to answer everyone. So you may know how to answer everyone. It's amazing how quick we can talk about somebody else. I don't want you to put up your hand, but I want to ask you this question, and I want you to answer yourself in your own head. Have you, in the last seven days, spoken ill of somebody? And I don't care if they've treated you badly or unfair. Have you spoken ill of somebody in the last seven days? I, and if there's somebody in this room that hasn't, I want you to know you need to stay away from all of us. <laughs> How many, even last week, was like, I wonder if they're ever going to finish that roundabout? Like, what's taking them so long? Why can't they get it done? Come on. Like, winter's going to be here, and then... The, the, how many have drove down Wellington and, and seen the road ripped up and complained about that? How many's complained about the construction going on right at Sturgeon River Road? If you haven't, you guys are amazing. <laughs> Second Peter 3:18 says, "But grow in the grace and knowledge." of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
To him be glory, both now and forever. Okay, I'm going to read this very fast. You need to listen very fast. And if not, write it down and, and reread it after, okay? Philippians 2, 1 through 18. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others over yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship, in your relationships with another, one another, have the same mindset as Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider him equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name, the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do everything without grumbling. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, do only, always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky. As you hold firmly to the word of life, the, and, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering or a sacrifice and, serv and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you always. So you too be glad and rejoice with me. You know what? There are times where we, have show, we should have shown grace and we haven't. There have been times we have treated others with lack of grace and felt like it was our responsibility to correct the wrong. Or at least correct the wrong that we think is wrong. Maybe you, you found yourself needing grace at home or at work or at school or in the neighborhood or in church and you're expecting somebody to show it to you. You see, it's easy to receive and very welcomed when it happens. But giving grace is much harder. It's easier to find fault. It's easier to point a finger. It's easier to gossip about the one that maybe needs grace. It's easier to be selfish and not think of others. It's easier to spread a problem than to show grace. It is. And we live in a world that takes the easy route on all of that. I know none of you would ever do that. You'd always show grace to someone else. I get it. It's me. I'm the one with the problem. And maybe this whole sermon is for me. I'll accept that. You see, I know that I need to have more grace in my life. Maybe grace comes easy to you. But I'll be honest, it doesn't come easy to me. There are times where, yeah, I, I can be pretty graceful. Grace, grace, not graceful, gracious. I'm not very graceful. I, I, I stumble and trip a lot. But I think, I think we need to come to the place where we practice grace in our lives. I think we, I think we, we need to actually really take a conscious effort in our lives to show grace.
And, and I, I, I got some, some steps for you to consider in your life. I, and, and I'm going to try my best to put these into practice in my life. So over the next few weeks or days or months, step one, before you say something about a situation, Ask yourself, am I showing grace at this moment? Am I showing grace in this situation? I would ask you, I would, uh, step two is you need to ask, if I speak about this, will it hurt someone else? Will it hurt somebody else? Are my actions operating out of grace or my flesh? You know, we we talk about what would Jesus do. We need to ask ourselves, would Jesus be happy with my words and my actions? And then lastly, am I showing the grace of Christ that has been shown to me by Him? See, none of us deserve His grace. None of us. And yet He still shows it. Guess what? You took the test and he barked and he, he, he wrote the answers in. You took the test. You went to take the test and guess what? The answers were already filled in for you. You know, the Word says that, that the accuser of the brethren day and night accuses us. And I have this image in my mind of of this courtroom, and God the Father is the judge, and the, the enemy of our soul is the, is, the, is the prosecuting attorney, and he's accusing, and accusing, and accusing, and accusing. And over here, Jesus is saying, sorry, that's been paid. Do you know what he did? Been paid. Do you know what she said? Been paid. Do you know how stupid they are and what they did? Paid. You see, Jesus has already put an A there, he's already answered the questions to the test. The question is, will you walk out His grace in your life? Will you walk it out so that it's not just something that you've received, but it's something that you're giving to others? I don't know about you, but I've received an awful lot of grace from God. Because I know who I am. And yet He says, I'm forgiven. He's showing His mercy and His grace. Would you bow your heads with me? As Pastor Margie said while she was leading this morning, God shows up. His presence can change a situation. And a lot of times, instead of going to Him, we go to our friend or our neighbor or somebody else 
And instead of showing mercy and grace, we gossip and, and maybe even do something that we shouldn't do. So I would encourage you this morning just to get things right with Him. And you may say, Pastor, I'm already saved. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm just talking about some of our actions over these last months where we haven't shown grace and mercy. We've backbit, backbiting people and, and speaking ill and, and finding judgment in places where we shouldn't be judging. And asking God to help us walk out grace in our lives. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, you know, I haven't shown much grace. Well then start. Maybe you've received grace, but haven't given it. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for each and every person in this room. Lord, I, I recognize that you have shown us grace. Lord, I recognize that you have, you have not only given us mercy and not given us what we deserve, but you've given us grace. You've given us life when we didn't deserve it. So Father, I pray right now for each of us that Lord, in those moments when we haven't shown grace, in those moments where we've, we've messed up or, or we've said things we shouldn't have said or we didn't have all the facts, and, and Lord, I pray that you would help us to repent. And not just to you, but Lord, that we would repent to those that we've hurt. To those that maybe don't even know what we've done. Maybe we just need to go and ask them to forgive us. Because that's what your grace would do. That's what your grace should cause us to do, is to, to reconcile, to come to that place of reconciling with others. So Lord, today as we, as we think about the last few weeks and months, as we, we, we think about the actions and the things we've said, Lord, may your grace overflow in our lives. And may we start acting with grace to others. Father, I think of, of Lord, those, those things that we say, that we just say off the cuff without even thinking about it. It comes out of our mouths and we say, we shouldn't have said that, but we did and it's too late. Lord, before we, we say something, before we post something, before we do something that may hurt someone else, may your Spirit arrest us and cause us to recognize that we're not showing grace. And help us to be men and women of grace. Lord, men and women who would show the grace of Christ. For Lord, for much has been forgiven in our lives. May we forgive much as well. Lord, for, for all that's been forgiven in our lives, may we, sh may we show that kind of grace and mercy to others. Lord, especially to those in our family, may we show mercy and grace. Father, let us not speak ill when we don't know the whole story. Let us not speculate but Lord, let us pray for individuals. Let us show grace and mercy. Let us be more like you and less like us. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for those times when we've done those things. Forgive us, Lord God, for the times we've spoken ill of others. Lord, forgive us for the times we've gossiped and said things we shouldn't have said. Lord, forgive us for the actions that we've done that are not appropriate or right with you. Lord, may we have mercy and grace like you did with your disciples who messed up every day. Lord, 
help us to have that kind of grace and mercy. Father, speak to our lives. Help us to be the men and women of God that you called us to be. And Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the mercy you've shown us. And Father, may we express that to others. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Don't forget tonight, 6 o'clock. If you're able to help set up, we're going to do that right after the service. But I just encourage you, if you want to spend time and pray here, feel free to do that. Uh, Margie's going to play another song, and we're going to worship the Lord. If you need to go, feel free to go. Wednesday night, 6.30, family night. Thank you for showing me grace and mercy this morning and putting up with me. God bless you.